For the women in the room, I need your backup and support on some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight. I need you to help me. If you're a woman, please raise your hand. I want to see what the percentage is for the women. Now, I need your backup and support when I talk about some of the research and its findings, what it means, and I need you to call out collectively, yes or no, as a group of women, that what I'm talking about actually happens to you in real life. Now, the reason I need this, because a lot of these gentlemen in this room, when they hear some of this, will say they couldn't possibly be true or right because it never happened to me. Now, for the women, assuming that you uh, agree with what I'm saying, can I get your support on this as a group? Thank you. For example, your typical male in this room, and in fact, the typical male in your life, has no idea if you go to a function like this or a party where there are 50 couples, this is the test size, and you're the last couple through the door, it takes your average woman around 11 minutes in that room to have figured out the relationship between every couple in that room. <laughs> yes or no? Most men have difficulty with this. In a room like this with no windows where you've entered for the first time, one thing we did find is that most men can sense the direction of north and point towards it. This is a very important skill. <laughs> now, less than half the amount of women can do the same task. Now, in simple terms, most men can sense north. Most women have difficulty. Why would men be able to sense north? Obviously, there's some advantage to this. Well, I'll come back and explain that. For the women in the room, what I'm going to say now will be a shock to you. But men's brains are fairly simple mechanism <laughs> compared to yours. Now, and looking at brain scans and, and the way they now reveal how we behave, give some deep insights into our behaviour, particularly into women's intuition, this, this strange thing has existed for thousands of years. The first thing you notice about male brains, and when I say male or man or masculine, I'm talking here about most men most of the time, most of the supplies, about four out of five men across the board, about your average. And most women most of the time, it mostly applies. There are no absolutes. You can judge which applies to you in your life. Men's brains are more organised. When you scan them, you notice that everything has its, its place. So if you can picture for this exercise, it's like he's got little rooms all over his head. And each room has at least one major function that works well in isolation of the rest. Women's brains tend to have functions spread more often on both sides and often front and back. In the case of speech and language, it's both sides front and back and back. The connecting cord between the left and right, the corpus callosum, on average for a typical woman, it runs around 10% thicker physically and carries up to 30% more connections between the left and right. And this gives women what we call a multitasking brain. In simple terms, gentlemen, that means that your typical woman that you would meet in your life can perform somewhere between two and four simultaneous unrelated tasks. For the women, is this true, yes or no? Yeah. For example, she can uh, run an internet program, talk on a headset to somebody in a foreign country about an unrelated program, be listening to a third party having a conversation and drinking tea. <laughs> Multitasking. Now, most men's brains, with less connections and more neater arrangement, can do, and I'll tell you this, they can do one thing at a time. Now, the women in the room, you've heard a man say, look, I can do one thing at a time. He's not being rude, he's being actually correct. <laughs> now, he can do it very, very well, by the way. <laughs> Real well. But one thing. For example, if a typical male pulls over to the side of the road to read a street directory because he's, he's not lost, he's finding a new way. <laughs> he pulls out his map or directory. What is the first thing most men will do with the radio? They turn it off. Now, think about this. He turns a radio off to read a map. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> well, if you could scan his brain, you'd probably get a clue to this. He can't operate navigation and hearing simultaneously. <laughs> he can do one or the other. If he's driving down the motorway and you talk with him, he misses the turn off. <laughs> On a roundabout you talk, he gets the wrong turn, you get the blame. <laughs> now, understanding one thing at a time mentality is a very important key for women to understanding any male in your life. So we're going to talk about excellence in relationships and how well can you sell yourself to other people. And on an increasing basis today in every business, how often can you sell yourself to the opposite sex? Get cooperation and get a yes to what you propose. Now, this one thing at a time mentality. Most of the men in this room you've had, from an evolutionary standpoint, a fairly clear job description. Nobody's argued the point until recently. <laughs> now, in simple terms, we describe men as lunch chasers. This is your job. For a long time, your job has been to find a target and hit it. So you get up in the morning and off you go looking. So it makes sense that your brain would have evolved with abilities to allow you to pick up a target in the distance, estimate coordinates. How far away is it? How fast is it moving? If I caught this thing, how big would it be when I got there? 
at the speed I'm going, at this angle, and the angle it's going, how fast do I go to head it off at the pass? How far do I bring my arm back with a rock or stick of this size, and when do I release it at this speed to hit a moving zebra at 50 metres? This is called visual spatial awareness. <laughs> now, scans show that it sits for most men in the right part of the brain and across the back, left and right visual brain. It's the number one brain skill for most men in virtually every culture. Now, it's a skill that most women do not need. The reason being, as the childbearer of this species, your brain is organised for different skills and abilities. Hitting targets, long distance navigation are not two of them. You don't need to be able to do that. You need other things, but they're not two of them. So the guy's out there, he hits the target, now he needs to sense north. The purpose of this? To get home. <laughs> if you're going to be a long distance navigator, you need to be able to sense direction to get back, otherwise you're a waste of time. So he gets back home with his lunch, throws it down, he lies about how hard it was to catch. And then for the rest of the night, he just gazes in the fire. <laughs> That's it. In simple terms, male job description. Find a target, estimate coordinates, hit it with a rock. Find north, lie a bit, and fire gaze. <laughs> now, men's brains, you fellas, your brains are organised to do these things. Now, fire gazing for modern men can happen at any time of the day. Most women will recognise that certainly early evening involving newspapers, magazines, or remote controls. <laughs> Now, here's a typical man fire-gazing at the end of the day. He's reading information, a magazine, or a book. If you could scan his brain when he's doing this, you know what you'd discover? He's hearing impaired. <laughs> he's technically deaf for using old, politically incorrect terms. Now, for the women, this is important to understand. Men's brains are organised. They can speak or listen. <laughs> Fellas, is this true or not? Speak or listen. We can speak or listen. Most of us cannot do both. This is why when men talk with other men, they have turns. <laughs> so if there's myself and uh, these two gentlemen in front talking, just on a non-threatening basis, uh, I might go first, I'd have my turn. They would actually let me have the turn. They would not attempt to talk simultaneously. I get to the end, and as I'm talking, they do just what they're doing now. They go completely blank and they go... This is men showing, I'm interested. <laughs> I get to the end and then he'd have his turn and we go, huh. <laughs> then this gentleman would have a turn with, huh. this is men bonding, getting on very well. How do women talk with other women? Simultaneously. <laughs> They're all going at the same time. Now women are the butt of jokes of this from men in every country. Men say in every country. We go to up to 30 countries in a year. And you can hear the men at meetings like this say, listen to the women because you can hear them. All talking at the same time. And the men say, no one's listening. Fellas, that's not true. If you could scan their brains, you would discover their brains can speak and listen simultaneously. For the women, is this true? Yes or no? Now for most men, this is a difficult concept to get your head around. <laughs> Speaking and hearing at the same time. Not only can they do that, they can do it on several unrelated subjects. <laughs> they can also do this in one sentence. <laughs> now, women operate on five tones of voice, of which men can identify three. Men operate on three tones. So a woman will start off on subject one, halfway through without apparent notification. <laughs> she introduces a second subject. Now, the women listening realise by the tone of voice, here's a second subject. Most of the men think, this is the same subject. Now they start thinking, what is she talking about? <laughs> now she brings in a third subject, goes back to the first. The women know three things were being discussed. Is this true, girls? You look at the faces on the men, they're thinking, what is going on in this group? They... Now if they know you well, they might say, what are you talking about? Or something very subtle like this. Now, from a nest defending standpoint, being a childbearer means that your brain would need to have the abilities to allow you to defend territory and offspring at close range. Long distance navigation, target hitting it is not relevant. You need a number of other skills. First, being able to multitask with both hands would be a big advantage from a gathering standpoint. You could pick at twice the rate. If, like most men, like 93% of men, you're dominant only with your right hand, which is your hitting, throwing arm, tie that in with your spatial skills, there's your lunch chaser. That means if you're going to do that in gathering, you're going to be limited. So you don't need a spot in the left brain to identify the right hand like most men. In fact, nearly half women don't have a spot on either side to identify either hand. They cannot tell left from right in simple terms. <laughs> and boy, do they get stick from men about this. You don't even know you're left from right, Cheryl. 
Well, no. Successful mass defending doesn't, doesn't need that. You don't need a dominant arm. You need to be able to multitask equally. There are far more ambidextrous women than men. And women have another, uh, several other advantages. I mean, anatomically, our eyes are the same. Men's eyes are slightly larger. Women have more white of the eyes. White of the eyes is a communication tool. But what your brain software lets your, your brain see is very different. Now, if you picture most of the males in your life, that you know, now, it doesn't matter whether he's five years of age or 65. The principle's the same. Has a form of mild tunnel vision. Most men can see far better than women and test to be better at seeing targets directly in front over long distances. Peripherally, most men are, it's all the blur out here, we can't see much at all, but we can see that fly on the wall back there. Tie that in with your dominant right arm and your spatial skills, there's your lunch chasing machine, this is his job. Now the advantage of that, of course, he can see a target undistracted. The downside is, he can't find things in refrigerators, cupboards, drawers. <laughs> Every woman in this room has recently had a conversation with a male. He's standing in front of an open refrigerator. See if you recognise it. Where's the butter? <laughs> it's in the refrigerator. Well, no, it's not. I'm standing here looking now and there's none here. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have had this conversation. Now, his sister's not there. You walk into the kitchen, you thrust your arm in the refrigerator and right in front of his face at eye level is a gigantic tub of butter. Now, there's no cultural differences we found in any responses to this at all. The only cultural difference we did find is that Eskimo women can reverse parallel park a sled in Point North. <laughs> now, for thousands of years, they've been hunters similar to the male, so it makes sense that they would have evolved with those skills. Now, a typical woman has a peripheral vision that operates at least 60 degrees from the side of the head. Now, most men start laughing when they hear this. Many can see up to 180 degrees, and a small percentage can see slightly behind while appearing to look directly in front. <laughs> For the women, is this true, yes or no? Tell them. Now, for most men, this is getting too much. You try to tell me, Ellen, that she's talking to the gentleman on the front table. While she's talking with him, she can see all the people around him at the same time. Yes, and she can hear what they're all talking about and tell you tomorrow what they were wearing. A multi-tracking brain allows you to do that. See, it allows you to pick up stimulation and, and information in your area about other people and animals. So while you're multitasking in front, you can see a person or animal approaching or sneaking up on the nest either side. Now this peripheral vision, fellas, is a bit of a clue for you. Kinsey Institute in America who study human sexuality, they found this is the reason women do not get caught having a good old look at men on the beach. <laughs> she seems to be looking there, but she's looking at this guy here. <laughs> now, when you come into a room like this, you're with a man, right, and you say to him, without appearing to move your lips, you say, look at that couple over by the exit sign. <laughs> What's the first thing he does with his head? <laughs> Women say to men everywhere, stop looking, it's so embarrassing. It's so obvious. Now look, if he doesn't turn his head, he cannot see anybody at that centre. <laughs> you're walking down along the beach, fellas, you're, you've got a woman walking beside you, and coming out of the, out of the uh, water over here on an angle is an absolutely beautiful looking woman with the best shaped figure you have ever seen. Now, you haven't seen it yet because you're watching that seagull landing on top of that lamppost up in front. <laughs> Who spots her first, you or the woman with you? Women know the answer to this. You spot her long before he's got a clue what's happening. Then you evaluate her as a competitor out of ten, marking yourself down. And when you finish that form of self-beating, then you look at him and wait till he sees her. When he goes, you dirty mongrel in public! <laughs> the visual spatial area of the brain. This uh, the right part, which exists for the majority of men, from age two onwards, men and boys test to be very strong in visual spatial skill. It also means that you can look at information three-dimensionally. You can see height and width, and you can see the third dimension. You can see behind an object. This allows you, in your mind, to mentally imagine something rotated upside down. And mental rotation is a very strong part of the male hunting brain. You can also go three-dimensionally this way. This would explain why 94% of all air traffic controllers in the world are men, wouldn't it? Why 98.1% of all air traffic crews in the world, in commercial airlines, pilots and engineers, are males, not sexist. We went down to see the air traffic controllers, as we do with most major spatial occupations, and we said, hey, where are the women? Why aren't they here? Where's this equal opportunity? You know why there aren't more women air traffic controllers and pilots? They don't apply for the jobs. You know why? They're not interested. <laughs> they couldn't care less. It wouldn't occur to your typical younger 
a student today as a female to apply for a job as an air traffic controller. It wouldn't make sense. They wouldn't even serve the job. In fact, you've got to have spatial skills to even be interested. Does that make sense? It's not that they're no good at it. They're not interested. They orient their careers into other areas where their brains are, are really more suited and they find it more interesting, such as 86% of all therapists and counsellors in Britain are female. It makes sense. Speaking, communicating, listening. Most men would think of being a counsellor therapist as listening to complaining people all day. <laughs> You've got zebras to hit. Spatial skill allows you mental rotation. This allows you to estimate coordinates of something moving in the distance. It's a hunting part of the brain. Most men are strong on this. Most women don't need it. Consequently, uh, you're looking at about 10 to 15 percent for your typical woman having the same spatial ability. It's also the area of the brain you need to reverse parallel park a motor car between two other cars. <laughs> it's also the area you need to merge on a motorway. 18 <laughs> percent of women in Britain will not merge on a motorway. Now this is something you never hear discussed because you need to estimate the speed of the cars going past and the speed of your own to know when to poke it into the hole at the right speed. So they'd rather not do that. And they get a lot of carry for men about this. It's also the reason so many women have so much trouble reading maps and street directories. Fellas, back me up. <laughs> You're going for Sunday drive, right? You guys get behind the wheel. You always drive. No one's questioning why you drive. You just do. <laughs> Driving is a spatial skill. Speeds, angles, corners. That's why men love it. They watch other men driving in a circle for two hours on Sunday. <laughs> on TV. Round and round and round and round. For women, that makes no sense. But he's in the seat himself, making all the adjustments, giving Hackett and those instructions. He watches a man kick a ball into a net on Sunday and rushes home and watches on TV on a replay. <laughs> Six times the ball comes out in, in slow motion. Now, women think this is a waste of life. <laughs> Why would you watch a ball go in and out of a net? Because it appeals to the spatial area of the brain. So you're going for Sunday drive, fellas. You have a woman beside you, and you say there's two words that destroy your day. You give her a map and say, which way? <laughs> Approximately 20% of women, about one in five women, are fairly capable to excellent on orienteering and map reading. About half the balance have, have trouble and struggle, and the rest don't want to know about it. Give most women in the world a map or directory, what is the very first thing she will do? She turns it upside down to face the direction you're travelling in. <laughs> Then she looks out on the horizon and tries to find a landmark that looks like something on here, so... <laughs> then she says, this map is ridiculous. <laughs> you guys say, no, the map's not ridiculous and your day is over at that the point. <laughs> Raise your hand if you had the map argument. Now, for the gentleman in the room, I encourage you to stop handing maps to spatially embarrassed women. This will destroy your European vacation. This will wreck your night out. You can get divorced over the map. Now, Barbara, who is my significant other, uh, she runs our corporation in both parts of the world. We live here in the UK half the time and Australia the balance. And uh, I can't multitask the business like she can. I can do one thing at a time and do it real well. But she can't park the car. And then she'll tell you she doesn't care either. She does not care. It's not an issue. She won't drive into a multi-storey car park. She'd rather find a big space and walk if necessary. She hasn't driven backwards in seven years. She asks strange men to park the car where necessary. She describes this as outsourcing. It's a way to do it. The number one skill for women everywhere sits in both brains, front and back. What do you think it is? Speech and language. In simple terms, women are great talkers, men are not. This is not a shock. Now, in a given day, a typical woman can speak a top end of eight to 9,000 spoken words effortlessly. <laughs> Four brain centres to do this in. You've got another six to 7,000 tone of voice changes with those words using five tones. Men can pick three of these. Another four to 6,000 gestures, expressions and movements Add this together, you have 20 to 24,000 communication signals a day output from a communicative brain of a typical nest defending female, effortlessly. Typical male does 7 to 10,000 a day. Now, will you notice the difference when you sit down for your evening meal because he's done his 10,000? <laughs> Sound familiar? He's up for a bit of fire-gazing time, thanks very much. <laughs> He's 
got the remote control flicking from channel to channel to channel to channel. Men don't want to know what's on television, we found. They want to know what else is on television. <laughs> it's a form of fire gazing, he's scanning, and he can't hear anything at the time, so it's pointless having an intelligent conversation. You've got to get his attention. End of the day, he's fire gazing, he's perfectly happy to do this. Through the door she comes. Her condition depends on her day. If she's in a pastime or pursuit where she may be speaking, although she may have burned up 15 or 16,000 words herself. Working women are close to word burnout like working men. She's been home all day with young children under the age of five, particularly boys who don't speak, they grunt. And she's lucky to have done 2,000 words. She's got 22,000 to go. <laughs> but someone's going to hear them. And there's him, captive audience. So she says, hi darling, how was your day? What do men say under these conditions? Good. <laughs> 10,001. <laughs> well, have you got your ticket organised for the awards down to the hill? Are you ready to go? Yeah. 10,002. <laughs> She's thinking now, he won't talk as usual. Her dad was the same too. When he got home from work, he told everybody he wanted some peace and quiet. Men and women use speech and language for completely opposite purposes. We reckon it is the biggest single difference between the sexes. Men use speech and language to communicate facts and data. They have shorter sentences with a specific opening and an ending and at least one hard fact in the middle using direct talk, being specific as hard as it may be. When they listen to other men, what are men listening for? Facts and data. Women use speech for a completely different purpose. Now, fellas, this will revolutionise your life. Women use speech and language for bonding and rewarding. And what this means is she likes you, loves you. If she's buying what you're saying, she's going along, she wants to congratulate you, encourage you, she'll talk to you. Words are reward. Congratulations, have a few. <laughs> so at the end of the day, if he's been around women long enough, he's learnt you must say, how was your day, or you have a bad night. <laughs> so he says, how was your day? And so she tells him. You wouldn't believe the day I had today. I had the day off from work. I didn't want to stay home. But remember that blue dress I bought in Hawaii that time with the gold buttons? And I, sh I should have got the blue one because the exchange rate was much better. Now it's gone down. I've been kicking myself. But on the shopping channel, I had the same one with the brown buttons. And I thought for the awards center, I could get Susan's mother who's got that brand new machine. I'd love to have a machine like that. It's, it only cost 150 pounds. She could take it off and put it on there. I could wear it with my gold shoes to go to the awards. And, and, and John said, in fact, John's mother had a hip replacement. I saw her the other day. She's hobbling along. Oh, she's in so much pain. Now, think about this. He's happily fire gazing. And here comes what sounds, from his perspective, like an avalanche of facts and unrelated data. <laughs> he thinks he's hearing problems that she's had, that she's telling him about, and expecting him to fix them. <laughs> now, he has a fix-it brain, so what does he do? He keeps interrupting with what she should have done about each of these... Well, look, wait a minute, Susan. Here's what you should have done. What you should have done was listen to the weather forecast on TV, because that would tell you what to wear, and you wouldn't have that problem, problem fixed. <laughs> she thinks, he interrupted me. She continues, well, I went to that new shopping centre and I got on the escalator, got my heel cord, broke the heel off. I was so angry because I paid £300 for those shoes. £300 shoes, broken, problem. Here's what you should have done, Cheryl. <laughs> what you should do, you shouldn't wear high heel shoes on escalator. It's a very bad thing. Ankle injuries are up 46%. Wear flat shoes. Problem solved. <laughs> She's thinking, he won't shut up. He's thinking, why can't she fix these things herself? Why do I have to come home and fix everything she's ever had? Now the point is, for the women, please answer yes or no. For men, this will be a revelation. If you haven't seen a man that day, or maybe for a couple of days, at the end of the day, we know you are talking for two reasons, to burn up words and to bond and reward with him. No solutions are required. Do you want any interruptions with what you should have done to have made your day much better? Fellas, this is a breakthrough. You're not expected to talk. <laughs> what would you like him to do? Listen. Now, with body language, here's a man listening. Watch. Mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> now this behaviour, we, we classify that, we call this the grunt. And men do it everywhere in the world. When they talk in public, particularly amongst other men they don't know that well, they show no emotional condition. They grunt, they go, oh, uh, 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 uh. This shows they're interested. Now, the women, listen to this. We know that men can speak or listen, that's why they have turns. They go one at a time. That's because they can't do it at the same time, otherwise they would. If a man's talking having a turn, if you wanted to raise your own credibility and win that man over, your point of view, what would you do if he was having a turn? Let him have it. 
when you listen, listen to him with the grunt. Just sit there. This takes practice and go, huh? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But now we've studied this in business. Women who sit there grunting at a man while she's having a turn, that man starts thinking, she knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> your credibility goes up. And all you're using is male communication skills. Now, you gentlemen have a completely opposite situation here. Women use words to reward. They love you, like you, are buying what you're saying, they give you lots of words. The reverse is true. If they don't love you, don't like you, and you are to be punished, they stop talking. Withdrawal of words is seen, from a female standpoint, as a serious punishment. <laughs> Women use silence to punish men. Men love silence. <laughs> Look, if you want to punish the guy, talk non-stop in his face, change the subject. <laughs> Think about this, the biggest threat a woman can ever make is I'll never talk to you again. <laughs> the threat of permanent withdrawal of words is a serious threat from a woman's standpoint. It makes no sense to the average man at all. <laughs> now, when women listen, they listen differently. They use their face and body signals to reflect the emotions of the speaker. So, for example, if I invited uh, a woman in the front row to come and give a three-minute speech unannounced, unprepared, on a subject she knew nothing about, let's say she's up here and... She is dying. She's going through the emotional range of fear, panic, terror, elation. And she's trying her best. And after this, she's talking to her female friends at the back of the room. She wants to relate to them how she felt. She'd do it completely differently to what a man would do. If I said to a man, I'd like to invite you to speak, he'd go... And at the end, he'd tell his friends, you won't believe what happened to me. This guy got me up there. I'm never going to do this again. I'm not sitting in the front row again. He'd give it a solution. Here's what a woman might say to her friends. You will not believe what happened to me. <laughs> this guy got me to come up and speak for three minutes on a subject I know nothing about. Oh, I died. I saw the faces. I died. It was so terrible. Oh, I'm never doing it again. My faces are sweating. Here's the point. If you look at the female friends that she's telling the story to, you'd swear it had happened to them too. <laughs> and what are they doing? They're feeding back her emotions on their face. They're going, no, you did. Oh, you poor thing. I must have died. Oh, they're all dying together. Fellas, you want to be a, a hit with women in business and personal life? This is what you've got to do. Don't sit there and grunt. Huh, huh, huh. <laughs> Feedback on your face without offering solutions. Really? What did you say there? What did you, how did you feel? No. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Don't do this with other men. <laughs> this is the reason women love talking to gay men. That's what gay men do. They feed back your emotions, don't they? No, he didn't. Oh, I'd be so bad. Now, you guys sit there and you listen to the story and go, yep. That's how to speak, yep. Mm -hmm. You need a public speaking course. That's what you need. <laughs> and tries to give her this. He didn't want the solution. She wanted to share her emotion. You're going to dinner tonight. She's got a brand new dress coming to a function just like this. She comes out of the bedroom wearing the dress, holds up two pairs of shoes, one blue and one gold. And she says, darling, should I wear blue or gold shoes with this dress? Love them both, I just can't decide which one. <laughs> okay, Mr. Girlfriend? <laughs> Should I wear blue or gold shoes? What do you think? It's up to you. It's up, it's, it's up to you. <laughs> Is that a good answer? It's not a good answer. <laughs> no, good I really need your help, darling. Blue or gold, what do you think? Blue. Blue, okay, so he gave him for blue. Mr. 32 years, darling, what do you think? Blue or gold? Well, um, I'd like to see the whole thing. He's stalling. He's stalling for time. <laughs> You see, 32 years ago, he picked blue too. <laughs> and that was the end of his night, wasn't it? <laughs> now, for the women, please answer yes or no for this gentleman. When she says to him, should I wear blue or gold, is she asking him to choose her shoes? No, no she's already chosen the shoes before the question was asked. <laughs> he thought it was a problem-solving question. <laughs> he chose blue. He chose blue. What's the next thing she's going to say to him? What's wrong with the gold? <laughs> Don't you like the gold? You've never liked them. <laughs> Have the courage to say what you think. Go on your own for what? <laughs> Fellas, raise your hand if you have had this conversation. <laughs> Should I wear blue or gold? It's not the question. The real question in indirect female language is, tell me I am beautiful tonight. <laughs> That's what it means. See, some questions cannot be answered, like... Does this dress make my rear look too big? How do you answer that? 
You can't answer this question. Give them a round of applause. Thank you.